Yes, I am the longest continuous uh, member of VSA. Uh, I would be tied with Cheng, but she was gone for a year, so then I slipped into first place. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's awesome uh, to be here with you all tonight. It's awesome that you're all here. Um, I realize that like, I don't know all of you super well uh, the way that I would like to, especially if you're in VSA. I used to spend a lot of time uh, with VSA when I first uh, was here at UVA. Um, when AIV first began, and uh, you've always been very near and dear to my heart, and so I'm glad that we can do this really cool thing where we can come together, and even though like we're we're really different orgs with different kind of experiences, we can talk about something that is uh, shared and, and joint, and we all are experiencing kind of at the same time, especially you as students. Um, so yeah, hopefully hopefully what we do tonight is um, give you some language, give you some clarity about things you're feeling or experiencing. Um, probably give you maybe give you some ability to answer questions you're you're asking. Uh, I'm not going to pretend that I have like a single formula for you. Like that would be so great. I'd be so rich if I did, but I don't. Um, but I think um, you know it, we have to be, begin by saying like this is not easy. Like trying to figure out what you're supposed to do with your life and like be able to live with it is not the easiest thing in the world. And it's even harder when you've got uh, when you're not just um, when when you've had various sets of cultural experiences in your life. So let me uh, jump into that and, and kind of illustrate that for a second. So how many of you have ever been to like a friend's house who's Asian? Good. All right, that's like everybody. Good. So like when you go there, like after you take your shoes off, right? Uh, the first thing you do, like you you usually have to greet uh, the host, right? Maybe you've got like a friend, so I don't know, like a Kevin or Sarah. Nice generic Asian American names. Okay, if you have those names. Um, so you go there. Hi, Sarah. Yes. Uh, so you go to you go to this person's house and you get and you gotta greet somebody's mom, right? And when you address this person's mom, how do you address them? You usually use a family term, right? Auntie something or other, or uncle something or other. Now, like, they may not be your actual auntie or uncle. Although I realize, like, if you're, like, Vietnamese from Nova, you might have, like, 13 cousins, and then, like, she literally is your auntie, right? But, but even if she's not, right, even if she's not, you call her this, and then she is allowed to, she actually has a certain kind of authority over you as if she were your aunt, right? Maybe your, your parents might kind of ask her to pick you up at your school, like she might feed you, and if you like act the fool, she will also discipline you, right? Like a real aunt would. Um, yeah, you can see, she's mad at him for something. Um, so then let's pretend like you go over a friend's house who's not Asian, they're white, right? I don't know, like uh, Kendall or Carter or something. Uh, and uh, <laughs> when, you, when you get there, when you get to this friend's house, uh, you usually keep your shoes on, which might weird you out the first couple times, but then uh, you, you if you like run into their parents, run into their mom, right? How do you address them? Usually by their first name. Oh, call me Barbara, and you're like, okay, that's cool, because it's just weird for you, or at least for me, it always feels feels weird. I have to like prepare myself to call them by my by their first name, right? Even when I first started working, my my boss would insist I call him by his first name. That's like really normal in our organization. But I always thought like he's also Asian, so I'm like the only category I have for you is uncle. Like you're not that much older than me, but that's the category I have, right? Um, so the fact that like you know what I'm talking about, the fact that you've actually lived this experience, right? It shows and it illustrates that you have the ability to navigate two sets of cultures uh, that you spend a lot of time in. You spend a lot of time in an Asian culture. You spend a lot of time in an American culture, and you know the rules for both, right? Nothing I'm saying is probably like really surprising to you. Uh, nothing I'm saying is sort of like I never heard that before. Like this is your life that I'm talking about. I'm just trying to illustrate something here. Um, you've been formed and you've learned to adapt uh, to primarily two cultural systems and experiences. Oh yeah, that's a white family, sorry. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about that first thing. Let's talk about these two different cultural experiences. Uh, the first one is American. Um, so American, right? It's not only white, but it usually revolves around kind of a white culture, a majority culture. And you run into this in a lot of places, right? At school, right? Maybe if you play sports, uh, or like you work a job. Right, you're usually around white people or like a white kind of system of way things work, um, and the way white culture tends to think of itself is individualistic. Right, it talks about itself. People are defined uh, by their own internal attributes. So if you were to like, um, I'm back up for a second. When you think about yourself in kind of a Western context, a white context, right? People think of themselves like, well, I'm me because of these things that I am. I've got these attributes, these traits. I like this. I'm like that. Um, and the authority to kind of decide that is me. I'm me, and therefore I think this is what me is like. And um, when you describe yourself, I am a trait. You might say, uh, I am energetic, 
I am fun, I am hardworking, right? A trait. And if you ask them kind of like how that you know is proven to be true, they'll give you a couple examples, right? Well, you know, I study really hard for this thing, right? But I am hardworking. They describe themselves according to traits, typically. And um, what culture tends to encourage people to be self-aware, like I know what I feel, I know who I am, I know what I'm experiencing. Uh, and then it also um, encourages people to be assertive, or to be assertive, like, well, this is what I want. This is how I feel. I feel this and I should, sh I should say it, right? Um, and it's also aspirational, typically. Uh, white culture in America tends to be pretty like optimistic, like, it's gonna be great, like, these will be the best years of your life or whatever, like, it's gonna be awesome, right? That kind of mentality is pretty, it's pretty pronounced in white culture, uh, white American culture. It's not a bad thing. Right? Th I'm not saying that any of these is bad. I'm just talking about two of them as they are. And so like the hashtag for that would be I do what I want. Right? I do what I want. That's me. That's white culture. Do what I want. Well, Asian culture, by contrast, again, I'm telling you things you know already, just to point things out. You run into this kind of stuff at, at home, right? If you're Viet, you know what I mean when I say scouts. If you don't, just ask someone in VSA, right? Or you go to church or whatever religious organization, right, your family may have gone to, right? You, very often it's like ethnic specific or culture specific. Right, and the way that Asian culture tends to think of itself is interdependent. I'm one among other people, right? I'm defined by my relationship to other people, right? Um, and so authority, the way we think about like who decides what, is usually about like who's like in charge of who, right? So with the white example, like uh, your friend's mom says, call me Barbara, call me my first name because I am my own person, right? I am, I am Kendall's mom, but before I was Kendall's mom, I was my own person, I'm Barbara. Right? I am me. That's who me is. Right? Me is more important, actually comes first before my relationship. But if you go to like your, your friend, Asian friend's parent, right? oh, call me Auntie Janet. Right? Because Auntie is the relationship that you and I have, right? so to speak. That's what I want you to relate to me as. Right? So Asian contexts think about themselves in terms of relationships. Right? They think about themselves in, in terms of who's related to who, who's connected to who, and what that means. And everyone, like, you generally know who's more in charge than anyone else in like, a room. Like if you have like, family gatherings, uh, there's like one or two people who get more of a say about where you all go to eat or what you eat or when it happens and all this stuff, right? Like the, there's a certain kind of hierarchy that people kind of know. You tend to know it unless you're like really obtuse, which you can't be if you got into UVA, right? So you tend to know where the hierarchy is. And so when we describe ourselves, we tend to talk about ourselves in terms of a role, right? You could say like, oh, I'm hardworking, right? Um, and that, that's fine too, I mean, people tend to do that. But in, in Asian settings, people tend to talk about themselves according to roles that they have or things that they do. So they would talk about tasks or skills, right? I am good at uh, cooking, right? Oh, I am a sister, I am an uncle, I'm a cousin, right? We tend to think of ourselves this way, uh, and we tend to describe ourselves this way. Um, so it's not that we don't think of ourselves in terms of like we have our internal attributes, but we usually like go to the, the behavior like first, because we're thinking about ourselves in relationship to other people. You're like, well, like, am I always good at cooking? No, like, or, it, well, within my family, I'm really good at cooking, right? You might, you might actually qualify your experiences, right? Um, so white folks tend to describe themselves according to their, their traits, declaratively, and Asians tend to describe themselves according to their roles, okay? And we tend to be others aware, we tend to be assistive, we tend to be uh, obligational in our relationships. Um, so others aware, like let me just give you an example of this. So if you're in like a, if you're like in like a, I don't know, in this room, if you were to turn around like right now, or actually even if you haven't turned around, you probably have figured out to some degree like, oh, here's how many people that I know in this room and how many that I don't, right? When you're in like a, a setting, like maybe it's like a social gathering, when someone new comes in the door, uh, you like, people tend to know, they tend to notice that the door opens, someone's coming in, right? And you tend to know like, oh, do I know this person or not, right? We tend to be just aware of each other. Um, I think it's funny, like one good example, so in my work with college students, I've worked with white students and uh, the fellowship I was working at here at UVA is pretty big and so students would like complain about like, oh yeah, I like, don't know like everybody in the chapter, th their group, like I don't know everyone in the chapter and their chapter was like 80 people, right? Oh, I don't like know everybody in this room anymore. Like they feel like, oh, I, I, like they're losing their grip in the community. Uh, so that's like at the point that typically white students feel like they don't know everybody around 80, maybe 70, right? For Asians though, like, the, like the, the edge of where you like don't know who someone is, like you've never met them, you don't know who they are, you don't know who that, oh that's that person's friend, is like really much closer to like 120. So we're like a lot better at being aware of other people, right? Uh, our level of empathy, our level of ability to kind of relate, to 
to notice these things, it's just a lot higher because that's like our whole cultural experience. We're always thinking about other people, right? We're always anticipating people's needs, right? So when someone comes over, right, you have, if you have a guest to come and visit your family, your mom or your dad would be like, all right, we gotta get everything ready, and like you go like to Costco seven times in one week to get like everything possible so that every possible need could be met, right? You're like, mom, why do we buy three kinds of toothpaste? I don't know which, I don't know which one she wants. So I'm just gonna get them all and just, and just let her choose, right? You know, stuff like that. We're always anticipating needs, we're aware of other people, uh, and, and we feel obliged to fulfill those needs and serve one another. Now, so I'm not using the word obligational in a bad way. It has a really negative context in Western culture, right? It has a lot of negative connotations. I don't think of it that way. I think of it as like, well, we have close relationships and responsibilities to each other. We, that's what it feels like. When it, when it works out well, it feels like a responsibility that we're engaging in. It, of course, it can be like not awesome. It can be painful too. Um, but yeah, so that's the hashtag. I will always love you. Whitney Houston song, one of my favorites. Um, so, but if you want to sum it up, if you're like Greg, like I like that was a lot of language, and like you're speaking really fast because you've had way too much coffee today, which is true. Um, if you're like, what what do I do with this? Well, let me just sum it up really easily. American culture is about me, and Asian culture is about we. We think according to this. Me is the most important versus we is the most important. When we make decisions, when we think about what we want, um, right? So if you've you ever been like a group of Asians trying to figure out where to go eat? <laughs> oh, wait, oh, I, oh I, I didn't even finish the, I guess you already got it, right? Because you can't decide. You're like, well, like, I don't know, like, I chose last time. And I don't know, like, she doesn't really like this place that I want. You know what, like, we're always thinking about, like, we're running through the grid in our head, we're playing chess in our head with, like, what does my friend want? What does this person want? Like, you know, oh, they're a guest, but, like, they don't know where they're going. Like, you get all stressed out trying to think about, like, what, what's good for the person, right? It's not a bad thing, but that's just, that's the we mentality. Versus me, um, I was once working with a bunch of leaders from that same, you know, mostly white fellowship, and I was like, hey, let's go out to the downtown mall and, like, figure out where to eat. And they were, like, discussing, and one of them was like, well, I want to go to Five Guys, and she, like, left the group. And I was like, okay. She didn't mean anything salty by it, but I was like, if you were Asian, this would have been so inappropriate. Like, really? Wow, that was like really weird. You just like left. You're like, okay, I'm going. If anyone wants to come with me, I was like, okay, not very we oriented here, right? That's, it felt really strange. Um, so me versus we is how we think about these things. So I say that because we have these two like huge sets of values and thinking in our heads, and we can do both these things. If you got to UVA, you are capable of doing both these things. Right. You're capable of doing both these things. You may lean one way or another more, or like you may prefer one, or the, you know, one more than the other. Um, you may have greater faculty with one. You know, it, it may vary, but you, you know both these things. Right. If you spend any time in America um, as an Asian, right, you know that there's two, you have different, you turn a switch on and off. Right. Like when you go home, it's one way. When you're at school, it's another, right, to a certain degree. And so these are our values, our tendencies. Um, and they could be good, they could be bad. I'm not talking about them in a bad way inherently. I'm just saying that's what's there. So these two things in us, oh, I thought I had clickers, whatever. Uh, there's a bunch of ways that they like interact. So if this sounds like jargony, I'll like break it down a second. So we have two sets of values. They think different things. One of them is like me is most important. The other one's like we is most important. And they like interact in a bunch of ways. And I think there are like four ways they can interact. So one is like, hey, we both agree upon this, right? Both sets of values agree upon a decision or an outcome. And that's like positively compounding. They compound, they, they, you know, they double up. They're like, hey, let's go, this is great. Um, they agree with each other. So that, that will make you like twice as motivated to do something or twice as like happy when you succeed. Because you're like, both sets of values that you care about, they're like being fulfilled. You're like, yes, like I'm double mint awesome. Like I'm so awesome right now. Like I'm doing, I'm doing it all, right? So um, like, so if you, many of us grew up like playing an instrument, right? Because we had to, right? But let's say that you actually enjoyed that instrument. Like, you're like one out of 15, right? Everyone else like quit when they could, but like you like actually enjoyed it. So let's pretend you actually liked piano. That was you. You intrinsically liked piano. You enjoyed playing it. You enjoyed working on it, getting better at it. And of course your parents liked piano. So like, hey, the me and the we, we're in agreement. So like them asking me to practice, it's not like this big fight. Them telling me to like sign up for this competition, it's not this big fight. Like we are in agreement. So when I succeed, I, I feel personally validated. I'm like, man, I'm getting better at piano. I'm doing a good job. I'm learning this new song. It's really cool. My parents get to like, you know, drag me in front of their friends and be like, oh, you know, he did so good or whatever, right? Like they get to brag about me. So everybody's happy, right? Both sets of values are positively affirmed. There's also negative compounding though. Um, it's when they both agree about something, but then like you can't satisfy it. So it'll make you feel twice as scared if it's like not going well or like twice as hurt if you fail, right? So like, let's pretend like, you know, you had this dream, like you want to be a rocket scientist or something. You like really, you love rockets, you love space, like, you know, ah, oh, I really want to do this. 
And your parents are like, oh, engineering. Like, I could be down with that, right? We're, they're in agreement, right? Me wanting to be a rocket scientist, my parents wanted me to go into engineering, right? Two thumbs up. Except, except I'm bad at math. So that's like not gonna work, okay? If you're a rocket scientist who's bad at math, you will like, you will like, and I'm, I'm half joking and I'm half not, you will get people killed because your calculations are wrong. Or you'll launch, you'll launch a rocket, right, way into the solar system in the wrong direction because you used metric instead of, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the British system, right? All that stuff, like, if you're bad at math, right, you can't do this. So maybe you're sitting there in one of your engineering classes and you want this thing so bad, you want to be a rocket scientist, like, you, you love it, your parents are like, oh, like, just keep trying, and you suck at it, so then you're like twice as pissed off when you fail. At yourself, you're like, oh man, I, I just want, I can't. Double negative, and that sucks, okay? The third one is that there's no overlap. Uh, there's not like a ton of these. These don't matter like so much, usually. Um, but it's possible that only one set of values like really is coming into play or cares about it. So uh, an example of this would be like, so a bunch of you on VSA, like you like to play football, or like, you, you, yeah, you like to play football. So you, you play for the IM team, or like Turkey Bowl, right, all that stuff. And like your parents are like, oh, I don't really care about this. Like as long as like you're not like wrecking your studies, like you, you can go play, that's cool, right? So you got this like, I wanna play football. Like I wanna be like, I was gonna say Kirk Cousins, but nobody wants to be Kirk Cousins. I'm gonna be the Tom Brady, right? I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be that guy, right? You wanna be that person, you love it, you're, like you enjoy it, even if you're, you know, whatever, whether you're good or bad, you enjoy it. And your parents are like, I don't really care, that's fine. Um, it could be the other way around, like if they want you to do something, you're like, oh, it's like pretty okay, like I don't mind, right? But this category is not like the one that usually causes conflict because obviously there's no conflict because that's the last category. The last category is when we have values clash. When, when you actually feel and want two distinct things that literally do not agree. Okay, they literally don't agree. That's culture clash. So maybe you, like, you want to be a graphic designer and your dad wants you to be a um, lawyer. Those are literally not the same thing. Like, maybe, maybe you can do law around graphic design. Maybe you can graphic design for a law firm. That actually would not work. If you graphic design for a law firm, your dad would still be pissed. Right? That, that's not going to work, right? <laughs> so two things. You, you want to be a graphic designer, and, you, and, your, and your parents want you to be a lawyer. And, you, and like, again, I'm assuming you generally want to listen to them and, like, you know, fulfill your obligations, right? But we're now in disagreement. And, like, that is really hard because you want two things. You feel yourself being, like, pulled apart because you want two things at the same time. You don't just want one thing, you're like, I don't know, I don't know. You're like, ah, I want two things and I'm being pulled apart. And that can be really absolute misery. And it's okay to say that. Like that is what a lot of people feel uh, at schools like this. You all are very high achieving, there's a lot of expectations on you. Your parents have expectations. You may have your own expectations. Like the university has its own vision of what you should become, like what it means to be proud of you and all that stuff. And so it may be even more than two. Like especially with the, the Western side, like, this part of me wants this, and this part of me wants that. So even within your own, like, I am me self, you can disagree. Well, that sucks, right? And then you got the whole other side. So it really can be a mess sometimes. That's okay to say. At a school like this, with capacities that you all have, as smart as you all are, as hardworking as you all are, this is kind of inevitable to a certain degree. Um, yeah. So let me show you what this looks like, right, and why it happens, uh, why it's happening now. So when you were like a kid in elementary school, right, you know, the American sounds like, oh, let's like focus on kids and learning. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. It's sort of like theory stuff, right? Social skills, kindergarten, and your parents are like, just don't get in trouble and you'll all be good. That's fine, right? They don't really disagree, right? What, what the American vision of school is and your parents' vision of school is like, they're, they're pretty, pretty okay. They pretty, pretty much agree. Middle school, right, they're like, graduate from childhood. It's now time to learn social skills and like learn how to handle your emotions and your hormones because like those are everywhere, right? And your parents are like, oh, you should expand your skills and your opportunities and like, that's one way you can kind of channel your energy, right? So they don't totally disagree, right? You're just kind of crazy anyway. You don't really know what you're thinking. It's just, it's just kind of like that. But it, it's not like real disagreement. It's just everything is crazy. And then high school, you're given some freedom to determine uh, or power to determine your own environment. So you get to pick your electives. You can pick sports or clubs, stuff like that with a little more meaning, right? And then if you're Asian, right, you, you're trying to determine your future success, right? College, apps, APIB, right? And like, you know, from a white perspective, like, oh, like, wow, this person is really academically focused. That is a good way to determine what you want to do with your environment, right? Again, there's no disagreement. They're equally valid, right, to each other, right? You can just say, well, you're just the person who loves, uh, you know, orchestra and AP. That's great. That's cool. You chose that for your, your environment. But then we get to college. And then now the American side says this, hey, it's time to discover your passions, experiment, figure things out. You have freedom. You're an adult now. That's debatable, but that's what they think, right? 
you know, you, you go, be free, spread your way. Like, go figure it out. Like, you go forth, right? Go ahead. That, that can work, right? It's not all bad. I don't think it's all bad. That that's one way to look at college. But then there's this other way. Continuing your success from high school. If you got here, you were in the top 10 to 20% of your class, right? Or something like that. Or you had something else going for you in the resume, right? It's important to use your time well, so be stable, right? You are, you are, your, your choices count more now, so you're being given more responsibility. That's what that means. Okay. Passions, experiment, freedom, success, stability, responsibility. Oh, okay. Well, well, well then, like, going back to that little list I had, which like, coexistence does this sound like? Is that compounding positively? They want the same thing? and you're ready to do it? Is it they want the same thing and you're like bad at it? Is there no overlap? Or is it the last one? Values conflict. I think it's values conflict. They literally disagree. You might find a way to make them overlap, but they literally disagree. You are literally hearing two things that literally disagree on a regular basis. Right? So you may not all do this anymore, but as like first years, you probably like have to call, actually you probably all of you have to call home to some degree, right? Um, otherwise, you get chewed out for not calling home, right? Um, some of you call like every night. Again, I'm not, I'm not judging. I'm just saying, like, I get it, right? Your parents want an update every night, and your white friends are probably like, that's like, a little weird. Most of them, anyway, unless you got like that one clingy roommate who, you know, mom's my best friend. Okay, all right, that's cool. All right, <laughs> right? <laughs> except for except for that one, right? But but most of them are like, oh, like every night, like that's that's not more than I would call. That's what they would say, right? Because for them, they're like, well, I'm on my own now. I'm an adult now. I don't need to call home on this regulated schedule. I'll go home when I want to, right? I'll go home when I want to. And if you're Asian, it's more like, well, I'll go home when they want to. And I'll go home when they want me to, right? So some of you have this experience where like, you know, you're looking for the fall break and your parents are like, oh, like you should come home. And I'm like, I don't wanna come home, right? But then like, if you argue about it long enough, somebody's gonna win or lose, but there's a conflict about it because we're disagreeing about who's got authority still, okay? But these are not the same thing. Not the same thing. So here's the hard part. If, if this was just like, if you had just one set of values, right? If we were like, I guess, Asians in Asia, not that it's easy there, I'm not saying that, but if there's one set of values, or you're like white in America, it's hard enough as it is. It is that much harder when you have both, and you know and care about both. It is really hard, because like, what's at stake here? So what's at stake here? I'm not trying to scare you, but this is what you all think. Okay, so I'm just gonna tell you what you, I'm just gonna name it. Right, you're like, graduation. It's going to determine the trajectory of my life for the next five years, if not the next 50, so don't mess up. Okay? That's what y'all think. That's debatable. I think there's actually, it's not as scary as it has to be. It doesn't have to be that scary necessarily. But you're all like thinking that. You're like, oh, I got to figure out what I want to do. Oh man, like I got to figure out like, where I'm going to be. Like, uh, like just, that's the stress. It would be hard enough as anybody, just period. It's that much harder when we have two sets of values because they're in disagreement a lot. They might be in disagreement all the time, in fact. You might be feeling that, feeling confused, feeling stressed. And I think that's because, uh, just one more way that this plays out, uh, our cultures have different visions of adulthood. So like white culture is like, yo, as you get older, you get more opportunities, social opportunities. You get more freedom, more self-determination, right? So like, that's why like high school has prom and middle school does not, right? You know what I'm saying, right? That's why high school, you can, if you're a senior, you can go out and get you know, lunch, and when you're a freshman, you can't. Right. If it's up to your parents, they really wouldn't want you to do either because then you're spending more money. Like, why would you spend more money? I'm just saying, right? This is the white vision. Like, YOLO, I do what I want. Like, yes, awesome. This is me being an adult. I do what I want. I can do what I want. It's up to me. But Asian vision of adulthood is not that. It's like not that. <laughs> so you don't get increased opportunities for social life. You get increased opportunities for success, right? Oh, not, now you can get a good job, right? That's the vision. Uh, and you, as you get increased achievement, is the, is the idea, and increased responsibility, and then you're increasingly reliable is what's supposed to happen, right? That's the idea. Well, you're older now, you, you are expect, more is expected of you. Um, it doesn't have to be bad, right? But there's, there are two really different visions of what it means to be a grown-up. And you would be feeling that. You're like, mom, can I just, right? Like some people will say, like, mom, can I just be a kid, right? If you're, if you're the oldest sibling, you take care of your younger siblings, right? You probably know what I'm talking about. You're like, ugh, mom, I wanna go play. Like, can I just not, like, you're the oldest sibling. You're like, but I'm nine, right? Doesn't matter, right? You're still in charge. You're still, you're still older than they are, right? You know, so there's all these dynamics at play. So if you've, if you've got, you know, if you didn't know there was an alternative, you might complain less, right? 
if you didn't know that like your white friends, how many of you seen Fresh Out of the Boat with like the, the white children outside are playing, right? And he's like inside doing school homework, right? He's just sad, like extra work, right? If you didn't know there was an alternative, you might not complain so much. I'm not saying that's fair or good, but because you know both, you're like, oh, I don't want to do this. Like I don't want curfew, right? At age 21, <laughs> like come on, mom, right? Some of you have that. Um, so white people can be this, right? That's like a thing. And Asians are more like this, typically, right? Again, these are generalizations, right? <laughs> but these are the visions that we have, right? These are the visions that we have. Okay, so, so how do we like resolve that, right? If you feel these conflicts, right? Uh, you're like, all right, Greg, that's like a lot of bad news. So what now, right? So I don't have a perfect answer. I don't have a single formula that will like finish it for you. But I do have some ways that you can actually get in there and kind of actually feel what you're feeling and name what you're experiencing. Because I think one of the hardest parts is you just feel generically confused or generically stuck, right? And maybe you feel like you're mad at yourself because you're not like making much progress. And, and like, and I don't mean this to like get rid of all your responsibility, but in the best sense, not all this is your fault, right? Like you didn't ask to have to grow up with two complicated sets of things that they handle, right? You didn't choose that. Right? I'm just saying it would be bitter. I'm just saying this is a hard load to figure out. And that's what's going on underneath. There is a conflict. There are sets of conflicts kind of erupting every once in a while. So we can just say that. Let's just say actually like some of my stress about my future comes from this cross-cultural kind of conflict stuff, this culture clash. Okay. Right? It's not like you're inherently bad at this. You're not inherently bad at figuring this out. Right? We just, because of our experience, it's just hard. It's just very hard to figure this out. Right? We have things that we have to worry about that other people don't have to worry about. Twice as many things to worry about. Uh, and so, you know, maybe you're in this place where you're like, I'm just like, really stuck. And because you feel stuck, you're like, I like, don't know what to do. You're just really, you're feeling really lazy, right? That's like really common. I just want to say that's pretty common in college that your level of motivation and clarity kind of drops at some point, if not for a long time, right? And maybe at this point you're like telling yourself, oh man, I'm just like lazy. I just need to like figure it out, okay? I'm gonna say that I don't think any of you is like just lazy. That's not like a thing. Okay. I believe that from a, from a, for a variety of reasons, one of which is actually spiritual. That's not like a character trait. It's the defect of other character traits. Right? I'm lazy because other things that I am capable of being are not free to be those things. Right? So I'm lazy because I, I don't know what to do with my energy, or I feel like it's impossible, or I feel stuck. Right? So like, it's possible that maybe, maybe one of you is like, actually constitutionally lazy. Most of you probably not. Most of you are circumstantially feeling really stuck, so you're like, well, like, what's the point? I like, don't even know what I'm doing. Like, what am I? I don't care. I'm stuck. I'm, I'm, Worn out, I'm tired, right? You're probably not lazy, you're probably not just like a confused person. There's something going on underneath. And it's okay to say that. It's okay to say that something, else go something is going on underneath. Um, yeah, it might be workload overload, right? You might be like, I can't do this, right? You're trying to fulfill a set of dreams whether you want to or not, and you just can't do it, right? You have limitations. It's okay to say that. Uh, I'm not saying that means you should be a scrub, but like, you have limitations. It's unnatural to be able to pull like five all-nighters in a row. It's unnatural. And even if you can do it, you probably shouldn't brag about it. Like that's not healthy, folks, right? Like you're made for sleep. Doesn't have to be like a, like a ton, right? We have limitations, right? The university culture says you have no limitations, right? Like student self-governance, y'all are awesome, right? Like that's, that's like not helpful, right? Just keep going, just keep going. Like, you're so awesome. You're like, I'm really tired. Yeah, but you're awesome, so just stay up longer. Yeah, but like, you don't understand, man. Like, I'm really tired. Yeah, yeah, but you're awesome. Like, that's what the university will tell you. And your parents are like, what are your grades like? And you're like, uh -uh, I'll stay up. <laughs> like, that's, that's what happens, right? So this is hard. But if you're overloaded, then you're going to shut down. You're going to suck at what you're doing. Like, you're going to not be able to pay attention. Like, it's just, that's the way. It's okay to admit you have limitations. That, that's coming from the conflict in part, right? Um, so we can, know, we can name that and own it and say it, receive that, don't, you don't have to hate yourself for not figuring this out in one go. Please don't hate yourself for not being able to figure it out in one go. There's an expectation that you should be able to figure it out really easily, right? you've been really good at everything up until this point, you've been so good at everything up until now, maybe, right? This is bigger than anything you've had to deal with before because this has to do with like your whole life, right? I get that. Okay, so don't, you don't have to hate yourself for not being able to figure everything out. That's the first thing. So recognize that there's underlying conflict. Admit it. Own it. Be like, all right, like I'm in that. Okay, like I can admit that. I can admit that I'm not perfect. That it's, I'm stuck. Okay, great. Well, if you can do that, then it's time to examine each side of these cultural things. Like, what's going on in you? Like, you like may not even know what you're actually feeling. I tend to find that like, and I love y'all, but like I tend to find that like Asian Americans, we're like really emotionally imprecise. Right? We like don't know 
like what we're feeling or why we're feeling it or like when we're feeling it, right? If any of you have ever had a conversation with a first year guy, no offense, right? Many first year guys are like, you ask them how they're doing, they're like, I don't know. What do you mean? I don't, that's not a thing. Like, what, I, don't, I don't know, right? Right. It, because we're, we, it's hard to be emotionally precise all the time. And also, like, your family system may not have allowed you to feel things. So I get that, right? So let's dig in there for a second. Like, let's look at each side. What are we feeling? What's going on here? So for your American side, I'd ask you, like, look at, like, what do you feel? What does me want? Right. And sift through that. What does me want? What does the I, the me, the self, this one, the individual me want? Um, how do I feel fulfilled as a me, as like an individual person? What are things that I enjoy or care about? What are things that speak to me? Again, that's sort of on the, on the line of passions and stuff like that. If you want to go there, that's fine. But what things do I care about? What things really matter to me? Right? Not just in passing, but sort of like really deeply. Um, it doesn't have to be anything super profound. Just the more you're able to kind of name that, the more you'll, you'll be able to look at stuff and, and find things. Uh, where in my life do I feel constrained uh, or stifled? Right? Where is the me getting stuck? Right. I mean, maybe you want to get good at something and you're stuck. Um, and are there dreams or desires, like future-wise, purpose-wise, uh, that I have been afraid to name? Okay, I, and I think that's actually some of us in here. Some of you are like, I actually really love, okay, so uh, there's a student I knew at Duke who, uh, she's pretty artistic, and she like really loved photography. And she's like, I think I could actually like, like, it took a long time to kind of get it out of her in conversation, but she's like, okay, great. If I'm really honest, I would love to do something with photography for my future. I just love that, right? It's like, it's, for her, it wasn't just a hobby. Again, it's fine, it's just a hobby. It doesn't have to be more than that, but for her, she's like, I'm pretty sure it's more than a hobby for me. But like, I feel pretty stuck in like something else I gotta do. We'll put that aside, but being able to name that thing first is gonna explain to you like, oh, like that's why like, I would rather go take pictures for the org that I'm part of than like do my calculus. That's interesting, but because you, you want it, right? You're not just being a scrub. It's, you might be, right? If you're doing something useless, that might be just foolish. Right? But if it's the thing you actually care about, just say that. Name it, right? Oh, like, maybe I actually care about this. I, I care about this. You're allowed to. You're allowed to care about things. OK, go ahead and say that. So then we got to ask about the other side, right? What about my like, sort of Asian values and Asian self, right? Um, so we got to look into that. How do I feel in terms of my, how do I feel fulfilled in terms of my relationships and obligations? Like, um, what are ways that my interactions with my family are enjoyable or encouraging? Like, what stuff is good? What relationships in my life are most fulfilling? Particularly family, but in general, like, what's the most fulfilling? Uh, which are the most demanding? Like, which ones do I have to, like, really invest in, kind of, like, work to fulfill? Are there ways that I want to contribute but I can't, right? Are there expectations that I'm dissatisfied with but I, I'm afraid to name? Right? So some of us may be really dissatisfied with a certain set of expectations your parents have, right? Um, so like I knew, I knew this friend who like she, and this is relational, it's not vocation, but it's related. Um, she and like her boyfriend were dating for a long time. They're like a pretty good couple. I thought like, oh, like, these guys have the chance to like make it if they want to commit. And like her, her parents were like really strict about like, well, not until you get into grad school or get a job, whatever, right? Like it felt really constraining for her. She's like, I don't actually see why. Like I can't, we couldn't get married sooner if we, didn't, if we wanted to. Like that's really frustrating, right? What are the demands that are like really, really difficult? Um, maybe it's sort of, you know, your parents have great expecta grade expectations on you, career expectations on you. That's the most common kind. And you're afraid to say that. Okay, so I'm not saying you go like tell them right now, but you have to be able to name it, right? If you don't want to be pre-med, you should probably know that, right? Doesn't matter if you're good at it. It doesn't really matter if your parents want that. That's, there's a place for that, but you should be able to tell yourself and say to yourself, I don't really want this, right? Because whatever strategy you're using probably isn't working uh, if you're still at this point where you don't like it, right? If you're just gonna keep hoping it's gonna get better, it just gets harder, right? So whatever it is you feel expected of you, you might need to figure out what that feels like or what you, you know, have to revise that. Okay, so now this is like the, how does it get better? All right, how does it get better? So then we got a name, we're starting to get there. How do we name which sides are in, where our sides are in conflict, right? So we, we named each, we looked at each one, right? I feel this way here, I feel this way here, that's what I want. How do they conflict with each other? What are those clashes actually looking like? Where are they actually showing up? Like, where are these skirmishes happening? Where are the arguments and the fights happening? Where is the, where is the shame and the guilt happening? Right, where you feel like most guilty about what you're doing or not doing, where you feel most shameful about what you're doing or not doing, right? Where is that happening? Right, where is the conflict? What does it feel like? What does it show up? Uh, but also how I've been dealing with it, the strategy piece. Okay, so there's a couple strategies we tend to use. You try to appease both sides, right? You're like, well, 
I love photography, so I'll like do it on the side and like just won't, I'll just like work really hard at that there. But I also like need to get good grades, so I'm just gonna work really hard there. But that's like really difficult because then you're working twice as hard all the time and like you probably can't do that because you're just one person, right? But appeasing the strategy that we use. We try to do that. The second thing we try to do is conceal or separate them. We're like, well, let's just like pretend they're not in conflict. Let's just not, yeah, we'll just, we'll just, we just won't tell my parents that I'm gonna go do that thing this, this like weekend. I won't tell them, that's cool, they don't need to know, right? Um, right? Or I, I won't tell my friends that like, I, they like, don't really want me, like my parents don't really want me to do this thing that we're doing. Like, I won't tell them, right? We try and separate it, right? Which can make us kind of dishonest, right? It's not the best strategy, it makes you, uh, you end up lying a lot to yourself or other people. It kind of sucks, it's not a very good place to stay. I get why people do it, I totally get that. I've been there myself, right? But it doesn't really work long term because you're, you're sort of lying to people yourself and other people, it's just not gonna work. And then the last one is maybe you reject one in favor of the other. You just like say, well, you know what? This photography dream, I'm just done with it. And you put it in the ground, you kill it. Or you say, well, you know what? Like parents screw you and then you have a massive fight in Thanksgiving and Christmas and then spring break. You know, you choose one side and you, you just clamp down and you try to destroy the other one. None of these really work that well. Like the first one has potential to work. Like I guess if you're like kind of superhuman and you can keep it straight in your head, like if you can do that, you might be fine. Um, not everyone can do that, and it's okay to say that. Like you can't be, you can't have two vocations. It's hard to have two vocations. Like it's not easy to do. You gotta be able to be present where you are, right? And be able to live with it. So what you have to do is you have to work to resolve the conflict. And this is not fun because Asians don't like conflict. Right? We like to feel like, fighting? No, nobody's fighting. Everything's good, right? The behind closed doors. Oh my gosh, I hate this person, right? Um, we need to work to resolve conflict. So some of that's practical, right? Some of it's practical, right? What is it gonna take for me to be able to make peace with both sides, right? And that takes some hard work and thinking, right? You might realize, like, maybe, like, I don't know if I should try and become a professional photographer, at least full-time. Maybe I'll do it as a side business, right? I have a bunch of friends who do that, right? Okay, that worked out, right? But what is it gonna take to make peace with both sides so that you can live with yourself and your choices you're making. Because right? if you're constantly just appeasing one at the, at the cost of the other, it's gonna suck. You're gonna get stuck. You're gonna get tired. It's not gonna work, right? That's where a lot of you feel like you are. Um, that could be you rene renegotiate goals with your family, okay? That's like the hugest thing for a lot of you. I realize that. Um, but part of growing up, and this isn't just me saying this because I'm like, you know, from a white perspective, I'm not saying that culturally, right? You, we need to be able to have conversations with our parents about sort of like, hey, here's what you expect and here's where I am with that. And can we talk about what, what you expect and why you expect that, right? If you feel like that's gonna keep you stuck, you, have to, you, have to, you either have to live with it or you have to renegotiate it, right? There's only one way. Or you leave, I guess, right? I'm, not, I'm not advocating that, right? But like that, that's the extreme choice, right? I'm out, I'm gone. I have friends who've done that. They can't stand it, whatever that means with their family, so they, they, they peace out, right? Maybe that's necessary. Usually though, you, if we did the conflict work, we could actually work to make some resolution. Great, so I can answer some questions more about that if you want practically after, but there's practical resolution work we have to do, right? Otherwise we just get stuck, right? And then you burn out because you're trying to do two things at the same time all the time, you get depressed and all this stuff happens. It's no good. Here's the last one though, and this is like more abstract or deeper, depending on how you put it. You have to figure out what you want to do foundationally, right? Because either of these two strategies is not like enough, right? It, it, they can lead you astray, right? If all you do is listen to your parents, that could lead you astray. All you did was listen to like what you want to do passions wise and like you don't actually know what you're about, that would be also just, could be just as bad. Um, it's not just enough to kind of know both sides. You have to actually have something that's deeper than these cultural experiences. You have to have some kind of set of foundations. And this is a spiritual question. So I'm not gonna like preach it to y'all, okay? Like I get that this is a shared event, right? What I am gonna say is that the real question actually is a little more spiritual. You have to know what you're about. Right? You have to know what you care about you have to know what you value, you have to know what you believe, what you want to be about in your life, right? And you notice that that's not a question that's answered with like, pick my major or find me my next job. Those can play into it, those can support it, but like you might have to take a job that like doesn't really complement the thing you really care about the most, but then you could live with it because you're like, well, I'm still about the main thing that I care about. You know, so I, uh, I had a friend who really, what's the best way to describe this? So a uh, coworker of mine, I guess is a better way to put it, like he really wanted to do what I do for a living. Um, he really wanted to work with college students full time. He loves working with college students. But his parents were like, you're gonna become a lawyer, right? And they were not gonna move on this. 
right? There's a lot of, he could have done a lot of things, but what he chose to do, he said, all right, here's how I'm going to live with this. I know what I'm about. I'm about working with college students. So mm -hmm. I'm going to give every free moment that I have all the money that I make to this outcome because I care about this. And if, if being a lawyer is what it takes to kind of appease my parents and make them like get off my case after a certain number of years, then I'll do that. That's kind of extreme, but he did this. So he went to law school, uh, and then he was a lawyer until he paid back. For him, he, they kind of kept saying, well, we, you owe us because we pay for your education. He said, that's fine, right? I'll pay it back. That was kind of crazy, but he did that, okay? And then he like donated the rest. He like set a lot of money out to give back to them. He put money like aside to like donate to university stuff, right? Camps ministry stuff, students, student stuff. He volunteered at like conferences and like he would go on campus once a day to like meet with students, right? So he was still about the student work, even though his job happened to be being a lawyer. Now eventually he was like, I've fulfilled my obligation. Actually, I'm going to step out of this and I'm going to be the student thing full time, right? But he he found a way to stay sane because you know he he knew what he was about. I have lots of friends who say, well, you know, I want to be about this thing, but I can't, and they don't w do the work to figure out how to make it work. They don't do the work, the sacrifice is necessary. Also, that friend, that, that coworker, he said, hey, I'm going to get, I really care about student work, I'm going to, like, live as if that's who I am. So he, like, instead of making his lawyer salary, he made, like, my salary, which is not a lawyer salary, okay? <laughs> it drove his parents crazy. They're like, the whole point is that you did this so that you can make money. He's like, no, 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 like, that's your point. And you want that, so I will do it. That is fine, right? But that's not my point. My point is to work with students. I, I'm a, so I'm going to take the. I'm going to give away 67% of my income. That's fine. If that's what, if you want me to do this, I am finally doing it. I'll pay you back. That's totally. I, he accepted that, right? You see how different that is, though, than just saying, "Well, you know, just got to do what I got to do." Some of you may not have the utter freedom to get everything you want, but if you know what you're about, you'll be able to live with yourself and get there eventually. Make space eventually if you stay focused, right? But that's a deeper thing. That's a deeper thing. That is not easy. Right? For some of you, for some of us, it clearly, distinctly is in the context of faith and spirituality and religion. And even if you never explore that, like, again, this is what we do in AIV. We'd love to help you kind of explore those questions right? Um, and our experience of those things. For others of you, you have an idea of what you want to be about, but you need, to, you need to name it. You need to be able to say that and own it. Right? There's actually a lot of freedom in doing that. Right? This guy who's giving away all this money, right, kind of fighting with his parents on and off, right, he felt free. He said, hey, I know what I'm doing. I know what my life's about, and actually I'm fulfilling my obligations. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. That was his way of doing it. There's lots of other ways, right? But that's just one example that I think was like he, he had to work hard at both, right? Um, you know, for, for us in AAV, we're, we, this is like a big thing for us. Like if you're Asian, this question is hard. It's really hard, okay? Again, I want to say that. It's really hard. You're not crazy if you don't have the perfect answer. You're not crazy if you feel these things. You're normal, right? You're normal. Uh, we're actually dedicating a whole like month-long series. This is like week two of our four-week series uh, called Work So Hard. Right? Why do we work so hard? Uh -huh. um, and it's about helping us answer these questions from a deeper perspective. You're welcome to come to that stuff if you want to, right? Um, but I just encourage you to ask these questions that matter to you. About, you know, take yourself seriously enough um, to, to actually look into that. You deserve to know what you're about, right? Not just what you're good at, what your passions are. That can actually lead you to it, right? Not just what your parents want or whatever, but something deeper. So we're going to have the Q&A in a minute. What I want you to do is take a second, right? You all have a piece of paper. Many of you have pens or pencils, right? Um, ask yourself this question, right? There's a little blank space at the bottom. Think about, like, okay, so what about this, like, hit me, right? Is there anything that, like, kind of spoke to me where I am or where, like, where I'm in my own experience, right? So just generally process that for a second, right? What needs to be different? From that, like, oh yeah, like maybe I need to go dig into one of these areas. Maybe I need to just name first that this is really hard or something. Right? So take a minute and go ahead and write. You know, give you a couple minutes. Just think about that. Take your time and process that stuff. Um.
maybe that's a better way to phrase it. All right, so that's all I have. But now it's time for questions and answers if you want. And hopefully I have answers. But you can ask anything you want. If anyone has a question, just put up a hand and then we'll we'll talk. Let you shut it out. Nick. Once you find something that like is meaningful to you, like what you're doing now, mm -hmm. like how do you make a transition between that to the next thing? Like, cause it's kind of unrealistic to assume you'll be in the same position for like 20, 30 years. Sure. Or right. Yeah. Yeah. So, for like, sure. Do you go through the same process like several times, or is there like? A Great question. Yeah. Uh, so if you find something meaningful, like it's it's unrealistic to assume you're going to be in like the same position or stuff right forever, right? So how do you kind of negotiate that once you get there again? I think you actually do go through the same process repeatedly. So for me, this is my gosh sixth year doing this. Like every year, I'm not like in danger of leaving, but I have to re-ask those questions. Like why am I here? Like, what does this matter to me? And I think in my processing, I actually find new reasons that keep me here. Um, but you could easily get into a place where like actually uh, the thing you care about actually evolves. Right? It's possible that it could evolve into like a new thing or like a new position or opportunity opens up. So um, it doesn't always have to kind of be vertical, like mobility it doesn't necessarily look that way. But you might, if you care about something and you're investing in it, further opportunities exist or show up for you. And then you get to evaluate again, like, hey, actually, do I want to stay with this or go to the next level of this thing? Is there something else I need to care about? Right? Um, and I don't think it's like sort of hobby hopping or like cause hopping. Right? Um, I don't think that actually makes for a sane or very balanced life. Right? I think that. Um, we, we are all invited to care about a lot of things, right? But there might be a couple core things or roles or tasks or uh, career choices even that really matter to us. And then we just let them kind of develop into different things, right? Um, so it's theoretically possible for me in this work. Like, I might not theoretically be at UVA on campus forever. It's possible, right, if I'm older. But I could still be doing work with students or this kind of thing by supporting. I could be a supervisor supporting the next me, right? That's a theoretically possible, possible thing. I could end up working in, like, you know, this, these skills that I have, I feel there's a new way that I want to go apply them. Right, so I go into something new that's related. Or like maybe it's like, hey, actually, I, I think there's something new out there for me. So I knew a friend, again, I'm using a lot of religious examples, but this is, actually makes it even clearer. This friend of mine was like a pastor for like a, a church. And then after like six, five years of doing it, he was like, I really still care about business. He had gone to B school. He'd been in the corporate world for a while. He's like, I think I, my time as a pastor is done for now. So he went and like started a gym. And he loves it. I don't, think he's do, I don't think he's doing anything crazy. I think it's like he feels like, hey, I've got some other skills that I have. Um, he still cares about the other stuff. He's still involved with church and like family things that he cares about, right? But he's got a new way that he's kind of doing his day job, and it happens to be something else, a new application of old skills, right? So I think that like that's why career center stuff can be helpful, right? If you like want to look into, hey, like you know, skill assessments, personality types, things like that, or disposition things. What kind of work would I be, would I be good at? But it doesn't tell you everything, right? Because like just because you're good at something, you care about something, or, or you're you're good at a certain set of skills, it could be applied like a thousand ways, right? And a lot of like the a lot of the career center stuff can be not that it's bad, but it can be a little bit narrow, right? So you got to figure out what you care about, right? Um, and and apply it, you know, anew. But yeah, it's it's kind of a constant, ongoing process. It's just really scary now because you're like, man, I, I have like a deadline for this. Like I really have to decide, like by. You know, well, you're graduating early, right? So all the sooner, right? I get that. Um, 
you feel like you have a deadline, right? And that matters. But like, what if you could decouple the graduation deadline from your bigger deadline, your bigger process, right? What if you're like, hey, actually, like for the time being, I'm just going to try and figure something out. But I really want to deeply figure out what I deeply care about, what I'm deeply about. That, th those don't have to be the same thing, right? Um, it is awesome when your like day job matches your deepest convictions. It is awesome. Okay, I get to live that dream. It's awesome, right? I don't get paid a lot for it, but I still love it. Okay, because that's what really matters to me. It's not money, but this thing, right? But if you don't have that, you can still find a way to eventually get there or have them overlap more closely with time. But you have to actually care about this thing enough to stick with it in some way, otherwise you'll lose the dream. And, and then, you know, I get a lot of friends who I've, I, and I don't say this to be unkind, but I've lost a lot of respect for them because they said they cared a lot about stuff leaving college. And I know people change, right? When they go into the corporate world and they get kind of chewed up like, like hamburger meat because of the hours and everything, because you, you gotta do what you gotta do. And they kind of lose themselves in the process. I don't mean they become immoral, but they lose sight of what they really care about. So then like four years later, they're like, yeah, I don't know if I should still work for Deloitte. I'm like, well, what's keeping you there? And then they don't know. Money I get, right? That's sad, right? Right? If, 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 what's the money for, right? And you can, you can work on that kind of ongoingly, right? So you, there's freedom to separate those two things. The deeper question, what do I care about? And the present question of like, I kind of got to have something after graduation. Those are okay. It's okay to care about that. But don't let the short deadline determine your like deep values deadline. That'd be awful, right? That'd be so terrible, right? That, uh, you know, there's, again, there's processes you can just take time to work on. Some of, that, some of that takes a long time to kind of figure out, and that's okay, right? I'm trying to give you a long game vision. It's not, a, you know, right? it's not like a one-shot strategy. A long game vision so that by the time that you're older, maybe you have kids, you, you know, like, hey, I know what I'm about, right? I think it'll happen sooner if you really work on it, right? Um, but it doesn't always come all at once, right? And it's not like, most vocational searching is not like Instagram worthy, okay? It's not like, I got my dream job, or like mad paychecks, and like I travel a lot, and like I got all these perks, like that's, that's like one person, right? So unfollow them. You don't need to see that, right? It's not helpful for you. Okay, unfollow them, right? Um, unless they're encouraging for you, unfollow them because they're just making you jealous and hate yourself. Just don't do that, right? That's no good. Um, so yeah, don't let the graduation deadline overdetermine what you really need to be about and care about as a person. So. Great question, though. That's really good. Tim? Yeah, how do you have that renegotiating conversation with your parents? Okay, um, it is ideal if you know what you're about first. What your parents hate more than anything is that you have no plan, right? They equate being unsure with being lazy and stupid, right? That's not totally fair, that's what they do though. Like, well, well you know, that's just what they, th that's how they think. So it's nice if you like, know, hey, I, mom, dad, I really care about this thing, right? And, and you put that out there. Uh, so that helps you, just put yourself a little bit of an advantage. What also really helps and really matters though is that you name for them like, hey, I know what you care about and I know why you care about it and I appreciate all that you've done to give me these opportunities. I think the thing that feels most threatening to our parents is that like, you know, they've invested so much in you because they love you, right? They care about you. They feel obligated to you in the best sense. And then they're, they're worried that like, because of, I don't know, like the, the foolish wiles of university, you're gonna make bad decisions, right? And you're gonna forget them and forget what, you know, that's what they're worried about. So if you can like look them in the eye, okay, this is why you have to be grown up to do this. If you can look them in the eye and say, hey, mom and dad, I love you. I pre That's hard for a lot of you, I realize that. Okay, but like take, you, know, you, gotta, you gotta be real here, right? Mom and dad, I love you. I appreciate what you've done. And, and you can even name some of the sacrifices that they've made, right? That helps them know that you've heard them and you appreciate them, right? And then you can say, so, but can I just also tell you something that I care about, right? So you probably don't want to go in there like with like a hard set like goal. Like I want them to drop med school expectation in one conversation. That does not usually happen. Okay, it usually takes like five. Okay, it's okay. If it takes more, it takes more, right? Um, but it's it's actually a series of conversations. A lot of us think of conflict as like the thing to be avoided the most because like there's no coming out of it. I don't think that's true. One thing that's actually good about Western cultures is that they believe conflict is necessary for, for growth and process, right? Positive conflict, like if you ever, some or student organizations do this terribly, some do it really well, where you like, you, you are able to express your opinions and disagree publicly, right, with each other, as long as you're respectful. Conflict can help us get further, right, by saying, hey, this is what I care about. Mom and Dad, I, I know what you care about, but this is what I care about. Can, can, can you at least understand that? Okay, we can understand that. We don't like it, son. We don't like it, honey, right, but, but we understand it. Okay, we made progress. We've made progress in talking about the thing that I care about at least, right? And we haven't quite got there. One of my really good friends from college, uh, she cared about public health and like higher education and service learning. Okay, so she's like a public policy major. And her parents really wanted her to go into the I banking or something or other. 
And she wanted to move to New York and work for, and look for jobs related to higher education. So she didn't have that conversation like three months before she graduated. She actually started this conversation in a lot of ways, like her junior year and the end of her sophomore year. Talking about, hey, like, they, oh, they wanted to be an engineer, that's what it was. And she was like, I need to get out of this. I love public policy, I need to get out of this, right? They had a lot of fights. They were not all very pretty, right? But the more they had them, again, you're gonna yell at each other, you're gonna have to say sorry, it happens a lot, right? If you can come back to the conflict and be like, this does not threaten my relationship with you. If you like fight me, I'm not gonna like run away. I'm also not gonna ultimatum you. If you can keep pressing into the conflict, you can make progress over time repeatedly if you do this. Um, you know, so that, that's one way that you can do that. So knowing what you're about first makes them feel like you're not like psycho and like making stuff up, right? If you don't know and you feel like you have this conversation, you do, right? And sometimes you just can't go in there with an advantage. You have to help them feel heard and you need to look at, look at it from a long game perspective. Just keep chipping away, making progress always assuring them that you understand and appreciate them. Because then they want to understand and appreciate you. Right? That, that's what makes them feel like they can do that. Right? Our parents have a hard enough time as it is understanding us. Right? I'm not trying to make us feel guilty, right? but like, they do. They have a hard time understanding us. That's not all, our fault. That's not all their fault. Right? So you've got you to give them at least a little bit as you make, have these conversations. So, yeah. Good question. Dan? Yeah, okay, so what are some big signs of the career path you're on, it's not the one for you. Um, if you're tremendously bad at it, you should probably get out. <laughs> unless you're like, unless, okay, unless, unless you like know from, this is, I'm speaking for the Christians in the room, unless you know from God you're supposed to do it, and you're really bad at it, I would not, don't assume, like God, God's not like gonna try and shaft you, be like, oh, you're gonna suck at everything. No, he's not gonna do that, it's not like that, right? Um, so if you're tremendously bad, I would get out, right? Um, if if you can't engage it in a meaningful way, if you can't find it meaningful, right, you, that's a little bit more gray, I think. But if you're just tremendously bad, you gotta get out. Um, I think that's one of those things that you gotta be able to say and own your limitations. Like, hey, mom and dad, I'm really bad at this. I'm just really bad at this. There's no way. I'm gonna be mediocre at best my whole life in this, okay? Right? Like, that's, is that what you want, mom and dad? I don't, I don't think so. That's not, the, that's not the paycheck you want anyway. Like, it's not gonna happen, right? So that would be one thing. Um, I would say that if you're doing it just because you're good at it also, I would not stay in it. At least not for a long time, not forever. Um, if you're good at something, if you like something just because you're good at it, that's like purely the I am me side with like no moral, visional underpinning. You're just like, I'm good at this, so I'm gonna go do it. There's lots of things we could be good at that we probably shouldn't do, right? Like, um, so yeah, like if you're only in it because you're just good at it, if it's mostly instrumental, right? Again, maybe the short term, you're like, oh, I could do this for a couple of years, right? That might be okay. That's not a good long term vision for who you're supposed to be, right? What you're supposed to be about. Um, other signs, if you find yourself constantly wanting and caring about something else, that might be a sign, that might be a thing. Uh, I have a friend, of, I have a friend, actually some of you may know her, she, she was an OIFA and she like works for like a computer programming company and like it's fine, like it's fine, but she's like I really want to do these other things, she has like two, three other things she like just thinks about all the time and I'm like, yo, like come on Lisa, that's like a thing, like you should think about that, like you should think about what that means, right? Like maybe not today, jump ship, but like, Think about, does this matter, like why is this persisted beyond your college years? You're three years out now, why does this still matter to you, right? And she like, you know, wants to spend time in those things, investing in those, not just hobbies, but things she cares about convictionally, right? So if you care about something else really deeply, right, you, you need to give appropriate attention to it, I would say that. Again, it might not be your whole job, but that's another thing there. Um, yeah, so that's, I'd start with that. Again, if, if we talked longer, I could have like a thousand more things to kind of guide you on, but those are good three starting principles. Yeah. Something else, someone else? David. What's a good way to discover what you're about? What are some good resources that you come across that have helped you? Mm, yeah. Um, ask your friends, for one, if your friends are trustworthy, they're not, why are they your friends? That's another, that's another topic, we'll talk about that, that's the spring event, okay, anyway. Um, <laughs> but if you have friends who you know who really care about you and can really see what you're about and care about you, asking them can be really good, especially as Asians, we, we have a hard time looking at ourselves in the mirror and, like, and feeling like we're able to describe things sometimes. Um, but contextually our friends may be able to say like, oh yeah, like, like and it could be something like really random, right? But your friends might say, oh you're really good at like, right, that event that we ran, you were all on those logistics and you like really you seemed to enjoy it and were good at it and thrived in it. Huh. Right? You wouldn't normally think of like spreadsheet planning as enjoyable, but for some people it is, right? 
you might not know how to call that a thing unless someone told you, right? So I would ask friends who are really trustworthy, who really seem to have, to some degree, they know you deeply or they have a, you know, their head on straight a little bit. Um, so I, I would start with friends and people. I would look for mentors whose life, I don't mean, I don't mean material life, I, don't, I really don't mean material life, especially as a Christian, I really don't mean material life, okay? But if you find people that you're like, man, that, their life, their character, who they are, what they're about, like, I don't know that I care about the thing they care about, but I want to be like that. Seek them out and hang out with them. And like, get their advice, get good teaching, get good mentorship and leadership. Um, obviously for those who are, are spiritual, like they're, you know, do all the things that we would normally do on a Thursday, like all that stuff, like discern those things, right? Dig into that stuff. Um, yeah, figure out what you, you care about by Going to people who've gone before you or who can see you as you're doing what you're doing, right? Some of your friends are going to tell you, dude, you're just, you just hate this, right? Dude, you hate this. I have this one story I tell a lot in AV. My friend David, from the freshman year, every year, every year, me and my friend Unping would tell him, David, you really don't like pre-med. Why are you still in it? And he would say, well, you know, he'd give me all the normal Asian answers. My parents think it's a good idea. It's a good, stable choice. I like helping people. I'm like, you're Asian. Of course you like helping people. But anyway, right? Like, so he'd give me these three answers. And maybe like one audible one, right? Like one that he would, optional one. Every year we'd ask him this question at some point and it would come up. Finally, fourth year, we're sitting in this dining area, one of the restaurants at Duke. That's where I went for undergrad. And he says to us, hey guys, and it just happened to be the three of us. Hey guys, you know what I figured out? What? I don't think pre is the thing for me. <laughs> and I was like, David, really? Um, yeah, how did you, how did you get there? And he, like, you know, was like, well, I was really thinking about it. I'm like, man, I'm unhappy a lot. I'm like, we told you this for four years. Four years we told him this. I, like, me and my mother just want to hit him, right? But Christian, I didn't hit him. Right? But, like, I wanted to punch him. I was so mad at him. I was like, dude, you wasted so much time. Like, we wanted to tell you this because we love you, right? So listen to people, right, who care about you. Seek out people who are trustworthy above you and around you. That, that's a good, I think, starting point for most of us, so. For the sake of time, I'm going to end it, okay? We're going to just end with announcements, right? If you want to talk about more things, I'll stick around in the back after, okay? So don't feel like that's your last chance, right? But, um, yeah, let me just uh, invite Tim back up to kind of close this out. Thanks, thanks everybody, for, for listening and your attentiveness.